that's how they stand for the North Bridge is three. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> We're not underestimating Russell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
not there. Yes. All right, well, okay, uh, we'll get underway now. Hello to everyone uh, here in person in Bangkok, as well as those of you who are following us online. Welcome to the very first event in 2024 of the SCAP Distinguished Person Lecture Series. Uh, we are, of course, very honored to have Professor Jeffrey Sachs, President of the Sustainable Development uh, Solutions Network, uh, join us today uh, to speak about regional integration and sustainable development in Asia and the Pacific. But before we hear from him, I'd like to give the floor to our Executive Secretary of SCAP, uh, Ms. Armida Salcia Alice Jabana, uh, who will kick things off with some brief remarks of her own. It's okay. It's okay. Dear colleagues, friends, and especially Professor Jeffrey Sachs, uh, as well as uh, Sonia and Professor Wing Tebu, very warm welcome to SCAP. Actually, this is the first uh, Distinguished Person Lecture Series for 2024. Uh, today, we are very honored and privileged to have Professor Jeffrey Sachs to be with us in person. Usually, Professor Jeffrey Sachs attended uh, our meetings and contributed to various discussion, uh, virtual. And he always uh, liked to attend the meetings, uh, virtual, not pre-recorded, but virtual online. And today uh, he comes uh, with us here in person. Uh, of course, uh, all of us know who Professor Jefferson Sachs is, no, no need of further introduction. He is certainly the staunchest a uh, supporter or proponent of sustainable development, certainly SDGs for many years, including during the MDG time. Yes, so including its conceptualization, development, and certainly uh, its implementation. We are very lucky that today we will hear from Professor Jeffrey Sachs a very important topic for our region, which is regional integration and sustainable development in Asia Pacific. Although maybe I have to put a question mark here, Jeff, yeah, whether regional integration is still still relevant or not, yeah, in, in times of this very, uh, very challenging geopolitical uh, situation. So let's hear his views, his thoughts on this topic, and I hope we will have ample time 
uh, later on to directly interact with him. So without further ado, let's uh, warmly welcome Professor Jeffrey Sachs and let me hand over back to Mitch. Uh, thank you, ES. Um, it is, of course, now my pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Sachs. Uh, as the Executive Secretary mentioned, we uh, many of us have heard him speak uh, to us before, uh, but I would just like to note a few uh, highlights from his biography. As I mentioned at the outset, Professor Sachs is the president of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which was launched in 2012 during the time of Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Uh, SDSN uh, promotes integrated approaches to implement the SDGs and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change through education, research, policy analysis, and global cooperation. All of these things have a lot in common with the work that we do here at SCAP at the regional level. And of course, besides being a, a world-renowned economist, a professor currently at Columbia University in New York, a best-selling author and recipient of numerous awards and accolades, uh, as, again, the Executive Secretary mentioned, we also know Professor Sachs at the United Nations as a staunch uh, advocate of sustainable development. He serves as an SDG advocate to the current Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, uh, and he has also served previously um, three uh, Secretaries uh, General as a Special Advisor on Sustainable Development. So, again, without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Sachs to Bangkok and to SCAP. Professor. If you'd like, you could speak from there or here. Okay. We need a Maybe I'll stand here. Maybe here, so uh, <laughs> okay, good. Let's try it this way. First, uh, Armida, thank you very, very much, and to uh, all of the ESCAP uh, colleagues and UN colleagues and diplomatic corps also. Oops. Let me just say how grateful I am to be here and what a wonderful way to start the year for me to have a chance to be together with you and to talk about our, our common uh, challenge and uh, my favorite topic, which is uh, achieving sustainable development. And of course, uh, achieving sustainable development in the ESCAP region isn't quite achieving sustainable development everywhere in the world, but it's close because this is a region that is uh, well more than half of the world uh, and uh, the Asia Pacific countries by themselves constitute about 60% of the world population and an even larger percent, uh, if, if we count all the members of ESCAP, uh, an even larger percent of uh, the world economy. So what happens in the ESCAP region is going to determine what's going to happen essentially in the world. And I want to commend you for the important and excellent work that is underway here. I've had a great pleasure to be part of a number of the studies, at least to be able to give comments or uh, to join online with the launch of reports and the work is really excellent, uh, exemplary, and extremely um, important in areas of energy transformation, uh, ecological uh, sustainability, and many, many other topics that you are considering. Now, <clears throat> I believe that achieving sustainable development is actually pretty easy if we just stop doing dumb things. So. Uh, that's hard <laughs> to stop doing dumb things, but the point that I would make is the following just at the outset. We don't lack for solutions. 
we don't lack for technologies. We don't lack for resources, financial resources, human resources. We don't lack for engineering solutions. Our problems are not, therefore, what my field is about economics. It's not that scarcity condemns us. It's not that uh, we're doomed uh, and trapped in an inconsistency between economic aims and our finite planet. It's not that we have to revert to degrowth uh, or uh, a even radical change of our economic mode of behavior, which after all has brought the world to the highest levels of output and productivity and technological advance beyond anything imaginable even a quarter century ago. Our problems are not the lack of what to do. They're not the lack of solutions. Our problems are that we're not getting along very well. And we're not engaged institutionally in the kind of problem solving that we need. There's too much panic. There's too much distrust. There's too much vying for number one. There are many problems with our political behavior, our organization, our institutional setup. But the fundamental problem isn't that we lack solutions or even that the solutions need to be heroic. For example, just to go to one right at the outset, clearly we need to decarbonize the world energy system because our climate is already in a dangerous state. We just about reached 1.5 degrees C, at least by the European measurement, which uses 1850 to 1900 as the baseline, we reached 1.48 degrees C warming relative to the baseline in 2023. So we need to decarbonize the energy system. And then you can ask what needs to be done to do that. And I think at this point, we could all recite all the things that need to be done. Uh, we need essentially uh, and especially to mobilize wind, solar, hydro, geothermal, some nuclear, and other kinds of zero carbon energy. We need to have electric vehicles. We need to have a hydrogen economy and other things. And then you could ask, well, isn't that going to break the bank? Isn't that too costly? Isn't that impossible to do? Isn't that uh, impossible on the timeline that we need? And the answer, interestingly, is no, not for any of those questions, it's not even that expensive. Because in sunny places in the world, it's already the case that there's grid parity relative to coal-based power, for example. So it's not even that it's so expensive to do. Of course, we're not doing it for lots of reasons. We're not doing it because they're powerful vested interests. There's lots of inertia. Uh, solutions require cross-country cooperation, and so forth. And a lot of people don't know how to do it. A lot of our governments are led by people who are two or three generations too late to have uh, received uh, a proper education in what climate change is. Uh, I was going to say something about my own country, but I'm going to try to use restraint. Um, but in any event, uh, it's not even so expensive to do. But what we don't have is what, frankly, a group of academics would do uh, as second nature, and that is, well, let's sit together for a month and work out uh, how we could actually do this, and we'll write a great study and we'll publish it. And uh, this is, uh, of course, what ESCAP is doing. But our political leaders don't do this. Our governments don't do this. There's something pretty primitive about it, actually. I haven't quite 
figure this out in more than 40 years. But why? We had John Kerry and Xi Jinping, both friends of mine, people I like, uh, that were uh, signaling China-U.S. cooperation. But frankly, we need teams of modelers working together to come up with answers, to write reports, to say this is what we're going to implement. That doesn't exist at all right now. This is what's so strange. So it's not the lack of technical solutions, the lack of economic approaches. It's not because uh, the rich people would have to give up so much that they'd forget that they're rich. No way. If it were that, forget it. It's that we are not organized in our minds and institutionally to do the cooperative things that need to be done. And fundamentally, and here's where uh, I think the UN comes in, we are a system of nation states still in a world that has global challenges, not national challenges. And the UN is our best hope for solving global challenges. But right now, the power rests with the nation states. And the politicians, for all the reasons that I've mentioned, don't know how to sit down together and actually take out the spreadsheets and make the real solutions. And that's been true on many, many things. So that's the basic theme. Now I want to elaborate. And I also want to say broadly that if we do this right, not only are the problems solvable, but the next 50 years would be a golden age of humanity with more chance for more people, both obviously in absolute numbers, but also as proportions to live decent, fulfilling lives with material conditions respected, with individual dignity respected, with peace, if we do things right. So I'm, at a technical level, an extreme optimist because I don't see any technical barriers. I don't believe in degrowth. I don't believe that uh, we have overshot the carrying capacity of the Earth just yet. I don't believe that uh, it's uh, pie in the sky to imagine a renewable energy-based energy system or anything like that. I believe we have the technical answers. And we can discuss, after my remarks, uh, some of those technical issues. I believe that what we're after is a new kind of governance, fundamentally, and a new kind of governance in which we have global governance that really addresses global goods. We have national governance for things that are appropriately at the national level. We have local governance for things that can and should be local. There's a name for this, subsidiarity, which is uh, multiple levels of government. Aim for the one that is closest to the people that can still solve the problems. But with climate change, that happens to be global. That's why the UN is completely central for this. It's also why it can't quite be done as a treaty of 196 signatories. It actually needs stronger global institutions than simply governments getting together to say they'll meet once a year. Because when they do meet once a year, they don't get much done. Because it's not serious to solve problems by meeting once a year. It can only be done through globally empowered, financed, coordinated efforts that are out of the hands of national level politicians to an important extent. And so that is really where I want to go in the, in the discussion. So first, just a definition of sustainable development, which uh, for me is 
important and operational. It means that we will escape extreme poverty and deprivation everywhere in the world, that within our societies there will be social inclusion, meaning that we will not have discrimination by gender, by geography, by ethnicity, by race, by religion, but rather inclusive societies. Our societies, by and large, are so mixed up with so many different groups and people that the nation idea of the 19th century remains one of the deadly ideas, actually, because states don't come organized like nations, with a few exceptions. They come with lots of people in them of lots of different, uh, of different uh, identities, and we need to ensure that societies work for everybody within them. The third, of course, is environmental sustainability, and I think the best shorthand that we have is living within the planetary boundaries. So I think the planetary boundary framework is very helpful. It says that there are about 10 areas of environmental stress that are identifiable, monitorable, uh, where we can identify unsafe regions of uh, activity. Of course, uh, greenhouse gases is a classic example. Uh, Over-harvesting or overfishing of natural uh, ecosystems is a second. Nitrogen and phosphorus fluxes, uh, aerosol pollutants, ozone depletion. And uh, that framework of planetary boundaries is uh, a good one. And essentially, SDGs 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 are all addressed towards uh, staying within the safe operating space of the physical environment. And the basic answer for all of that, the most important answer for environmental sustainability is technological transformation. So we need more energy uh, in terms of joules or in terms of terawatt hours than we have now probably a lot more energy. So it's not uh, you know, conserving on energy. We need more energy to have more material uh, progress, in, especially in the poor places in the world. But it needs to come from zero carbon energy sources. Oh, it's quite manageable. I don't know of any fundamental limit to doing that. I know of a thousand practical limits to doing that. But those practical limits are not resource constraints or thermodynamic constraints. They are political and process constraints more than anything else. So environmental sustainability is largely about technological transformation. People, I'll say for myself, I still want to get in airplanes in the future. I live my life on airplanes. What would I do without airplanes? But I'd like them to be on synthetic aviation fuel, that it's maybe an advanced biofuel, or it's uh, some other uh, synthesized fuel using uh, green energy, so that it's not uh, emitting CO2 in the process. And that's feasible, because there are a lot of different pathways to how to do that. So my view is environmental sustainability is mainly about technological transformation. But you need an economic system to create the path of that transformation. And then the fourth pillar of sustainable development, which is the one that I am emphasizing is probably being the hardest of all, is peace and cooperation. And that's SDG 16 and SDG 17. And those are desirable as ends in themselves, as goods in themselves, and also instrumentally. Because I can guarantee you, as long as we have these major wars raging, we will never make progress on the SDGs. These wars consume all of the political capital of the major powers. And as long as the Ukraine war is going on, and as long as the 
uh, war in Gaza is going on, and as long as the U.S. tensions with China over Taiwan are going on, we're not going to achieve the SDGs because too much money, time, propaganda, demagoguery, and uh, fear-mongering and everything else is diverting us from sitting down together to actually write down the real solutions and actually to investing together in those solutions because there is no way to make that transformation that I'm talking about without a lot of investment. And if we were in a world in which peace and cooperation were taken as given, when China has the Belt and Road Initiative, the United States would stand up and say, we love it. What a creative, innovative initiative. We want to partner with you. Let's think of 10 countries where we can co-invest together to actually make this happen. Of course, that's unthinkable in the current situation. But this is why peace and cooperation are absolutely fundamental for success. And so even though I'm a finance economist at the start, I spend most of my time on this last category, which is peace and cooperation, because we're not able even to have the meetings about finance in a sensible way, because that's also been weaponized until we have uh, the basis of trust among the major countries we won't be able to achieve the rest of the agenda. So some good news, which is not news to this region, but I think is important to state. Broadly, we're on a path of economic improvement in the emerging economies of the world. The economic, technological environment for the world is favorable for developing countries. And this is very important and it has been true for basically the last half century, if not more. And of course, China's rise is the greatest exemplar of that. The rise of Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia is the second greatest exemplar of that. The rapid growth of India now is the third exemplar of that. And I will predict that the next 40 years will be very good for Africa's economic advance as well. And that Africa in the next 40 years will achieve a lot of the breakthroughs that have eluded the African countries up until now. And two reasons for that, three, actually three reasons for that, uh, but one is that the technological environment is highly favorable for catching up growth right now. A lot of advance can come through digital technologies Digital technologies are low cost, they reach everybody, and you can therefore have, as we were just in Uttar Pradesh a few days ago, every small vegetable vendor with a, a QR code, online, immediate digital payments, and immediate receipt of government payments for transfers of various kinds, because this is now routine. Uh, and so the digital world is a great favor for sustainable development, broadly speaking. And there are a couple of downsides to it, which is that uh, labor-intensive manufacturers is basically disappearing to uh, smart machinery. Um, and so you can't have a pathway like 50 years ago, starting in uh, low-cost assembly. That doesn't exist anymore. But the advantages on the other side of universal access to services, education, health, payments, transfers, government processes, uh, infrastructure, maintenance and monitoring, and a thousand other things, precision agriculture, are huge advantages compared to 30 or 40 years ago. So that's one reason why rapid development is feasible. Uh, a second reason is we have a lot of examples now of how this can be done. And again, Japan was the uh, inventor of 
rapid catching up growth in 1868 uh, with the Meiji Restoration, uh, and then again after uh, Japan's defeat in World War II. Same thing, uh, the uh, decade of income doubling in the 1960s, which took seven years actually. Uh, Japan showed how to do it. Taiwan, Korea, Singapore, you know the story better than anybody, uh, showed more. And then China did it at the scale of 1.4 billion people uh, between 1980 and 2020. And the basic story is you need strong and effective government, a lot of planning, and a lot of public-private interaction, and an outward orientation. And you could add some items to the list, but the basic mechanisms for very rapid catching up growth are better than ever. And remember, in the 19th century, no one could grow at 7% per year, or 9% per year, or 10% per year. Of course, now a poor country has so much headroom in technological upgrading that it's perfectly feasible to imagine Africa having four decades of 7 to 10% per year growth. And I think that's likely to happen. The third reason that I think it's likely to happen is regional integration is becoming better and better understood. So Africa's problem, if I could put it that way, was basically Europe for 400 years. Uh, exploitation nonstop, uh, brutal. Um, but the end of that exploitation was 54 individual countries chopped up on a map basically at the Congress of Berlin in 1885. And you can't develop 55 individual times. You need to develop regionally and cooperatively. And now there's an African Union. And Africa is really implementing a single market and many other reforms. And that will change a huge amount of the capacity to achieve development. So my view is we are in an era of economic convergence, and that's good. In the past, the two main regions that have converged are this region and um, uh, <clears throat> the Eastern European countries that had been under Soviet rule and then were allowed to integrate basically with the European economies. And this is just taking IMF data of GDP per capita for the various regions. And up means economic convergence because everything is measured relative to the advanced economies here. And um, this process of convergence has not really taken place in Africa till now. But now the African economies, several of them are starting to grow at 5, 6, 7% per year. And Latin America, very interesting uh, story, really got stuck at the middle income level. And the main reason was inequalities and lack of quality education, especially technical education. So what East Asia did in technological upgrading, Latin America missed. And this is, uh, it, I could elaborate, but I, I won't uh, divert our time for the moment. This is, of course, the emerging and developing Asian economies uh, relative to the advanced economies. Soaring rate of convergence is likely to continue. If you try to project reasonably uh, where different groups will be in the process of the uh, economic convergence of the uh, 21st century, I come up with something like this. This is just using a simple convergence uh, formula. Um, and I'll leave all the slides for people to look at the, the data more generally. But in uh, this scenario, uh, basically every region of the world narrows the gap. I leave the United States or the US as the uh, baseline at 100. And all regions of the world will narrow the gap with, uh, with the United States. Now, of course, let me add in the population dynamics, because the this region is reaching 
population stability, and that's already happening in East Asia. This was the second year of decline of China's population. India will continue to increase population another 300 million people or so by mid-century, but then also stabilize. And basically, this is a region that's at the replacement rate, a little bit more population momentum, but the SCAP region is reaching population stability and decline. China's population decline is likely to be quite significant in the next 80 years. And as people know, the medium fertility forecast, or not forecast, but projection, let's say, of the UN population division for China is that the population declines to about 800 million people by 2100. Of course, this is mechanical uh, projection over three more generation cycles, so I wouldn't take it too seriously except to say that China's share of the world population will really decline a lot in the next 75 years. That's okay. That's not bad for China. It's not bad for the world. It's not bad for living standards. It's not bad for anything, actually. But it does indicate one thing, which is that China's not about to take over the world economy. Even as the GDP per capita rises, population share will decline, and China's actually reaching about the peak that it will have of world GDP at about 20% of world GDP in the next few years, measured at purchasing power parity, and then it will actually start to decline. So one of the great fears in the United States that U.S. leadership uh, is followed by Chinese hegemony makes no sense at all. It's not made by the most numerate people in the world, aka American politicians. They don't do spreadsheets. They don't look at UN population division data. They don't know how to extrapolate uh, in a sensible way. But there is no risk of China risk from an American point of view of China becoming a hegemonic global power. China can be successful, it can be prosperous, uh, it can manage an aging process which will be quite significant with the median age in the mid-50s. That's a lot to manage. This is a new kind of society for all of us, like Japan has pioneered. But it's not about taking over the world. So I'm trying to calm my American colleagues as much as possible. There's no threat from China. There isn't. OK, let me just go on. Population will rise in one region of the world, and that's Africa, for two reasons. The fertility rate remains very high four, even higher than four, 4.6 in sub-Saharan Africa. Second, even if it were to come down to 2.1, you'd have momentum of this vast young population that would add another billion people, basically. So Africa's population, which is now 1.4 billion people, is surely going to reach 2.5 billion probably 3 billion. And on the UN forecast for the medium fertility variant, more than 4 billion people, or around 4 billion people by 2100. That's the biggest single chain demographically. So if you combine the economic convergence and the demographic trends, just multiply GDP per capita times capita, what you find is some significant changes of uh, the share of populations in the world, overall population, and significant changes of where global output is going to be. So Africa, according to the UN uh, population division, will reach almost 40% of the world population by the end of the century. 
I don't think that's going to happen, by the way, because I think the fertility decline will be faster than this medium variant. But 30% of the world population, absolutely possible. 25%, pretty likely. Big change. And when you combine Africa's likely economic growth with the population growth, then you find out that the share of world output will shift. By the way, the East Asian share won't continue to rise all that much because of the slowdown of population. South Asia share will continue to rise because India is about 15 years behind China in catching up and the population is continuing to rise. But the biggest change will be the rise of the African economies. And uh, the uh, conclusion for me is that the East Asia Pacific is reaching its peak right now at about a third of the world output, but it will now decline gradually. And that's mainly because of shifting population shares. South Asia, which is uh, now at uh, around 14% uh, or 13% of world output, again, on purchasing power basis, will rise to a little over 20% of world output by the end of the century. And I think Africa is going to be where the biggest surprise and the biggest change in uh, our economic history in the 21st century will come uh, with Africa's share of world output reaching a quarter of world output or even higher in the next uh, decade. So I think a lot of investment and a lot of interest will go to the fast growing, uh, fast growing uh, African region. And if you group all of this together, um, of course, what we have had, what we are experiencing geopolitically is one very, very consequential, important moment, and that is the end of the Western-led world, which is good. It was a little weird from 1750 to 2000, one corner of the world presumed to run the world. Very ahistorical. Never was like that in the past. Asia had its own world, its own universe. The Indian Ocean had its own history. Central Asia had its own history. East Asia had its own history. It wasn't run by the West. The West gained a temporary advantage. That's over, in my view. And Good riddance. Good. We are really reaching the multipolar world just now. With a little kicking and screaming of some countries that don't exactly like that story. But to my mind, when you add up the pieces, we're moving to a much, much more balanced world. Again, just want to emphasize, it's not that Asia become, Asia returns to being uh, what it was uh, in 1800, around 60% of world output, and then it fell to 15% of world output at the bottom, and it is now returning to normal. The Western share, and by West here in this graph, I mean the Americas plus Western Europe. So this is just mechanically adding up uh, projections across regions. That was 60% of world output at PPP in 1992. It's now well under 50%. It's about 42% of world output today, smaller than the Asia share. It will continue to decline. And remember that the US and Europe are 800 million people total so a tenth of the world population. And that share will continue to decline as well. So the Western uniqueness came, it actually came essentially 
well, I was going to say it came essentially because of this guy uh, getting to uh, fossil fuel power first, to the steam engine era, to industrialization first. That was Britain's uh, major source of advantage. If you could get there first, you could go invade the rest of the world, which was uh, the idea of Britain in the 19th uh, and 20th centuries. Uh, or first, actually, in the 19th century, mainly in the 20th century, was trying to defend that uh, until the end of the empire. But basically, this era of Western-dominated geopolitics is coming to an end. And if we understand it, recognize it, and understand fundamentally it's not at the expense of living standards or security of the West, it's just the advantage of the rest of the world catching up over time. I think we can find a way to peace, cooperation, and a reduction of the sense of panic. I wanted to just mention very quickly, um, I wrote a little book about this in, in uh, 2020, just trying to conceptualize the time path of world history and uh, partly this anomalous period of Western dominance in the world. Uh, in a book called The Ages of Globalization. But essentially, uh, it came from two things. Uh, one, the worst policy mistake ever made in economic history, and that was China's decision in 1434 to stop its ocean-going fleet because the Ming court decided that all the risks were coming from the the northern steppe regions and that there was no big advantage of exploration in the Indian Ocean. So the fleet was scrapped. The famous uh, eunuch admiral, uh, Zheng He, died that year. Uh, and uh, China never ventured back out to the oceans until the last few years, actually. Uh, basically, uh, China retreated from the world's oceans uh, in 1434, and it was the single most consequential uh, wrong-headed economic decision that I know of in all of uh, economic history. Now, at the same time, the Europeans ventured out, of course, in uh, the 1490s, both uh, to uh, find the sea route and discover the Americas, Christopher Columbus, and to find the sea route around the Cape of Good Hope. And one of my favorite quotations in all of economics is Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, uh, where he says that the discovery of America and that of a passage to the East Indies by the Cape of Good Hope are the two greatest and most important events recorded in the history of mankind. Very interesting statement. Referring, written in 1776, referring to events 270 years earlier in the 1490s, that Smith said the two most important events in history were the European voyages of discovery. And then he said to the natives, both of the East and West Indies, all the commercial benefits which can have resulted from those events have been sunk and lost in the dreadful misfortune which they have occasioned. So Smith said, great. I believe in globalization. Now the world's globalized, but it didn't work out so well for the natives because Europe was too powerful. And what Smith didn't know, they brought old world pathogens to the new world, which was the second major factor. But what he did realize was this was a disaster for Asia and for the native inhabitants of the Americas. But then he concludes this, and this is, uh, to my mind, exactly why I wanted to reference it, because it's exactly where we are today. He says, hereafter, perhaps the natives of those countries, that means of Asia and the Americas, may grow stronger, or those of Europe may grow weaker, and the inhabitants of all the different quarters of the world may arrive at that equality of courage and force, which, by inspiring mutual fear, 
can alone overawe the injustice of independent nations into some sort of respect for the rights of one another. But nothing seems more likely to establish this equality of force than that mutual communication of knowledge and of all sorts of improvements which an extensive commerce from all countries to all countries naturally or rather necessarily carries along with it. What he's saying is someday Asia will rise and there will be an equality of force between Asia and Europe again. And how will that come about? Through trade. Good forecast. Smart guy. 250 years after writing, this is exactly where we are. We have reached, in my view, the equality of force that means that we are now in a multipolar world. We're now in a world in which technology can be shared by everybody, in which there is no dominance by the North Atlantic region anymore. And now we should get on with the tasks that we've set ourselves with the sustainable development goals. So I'm going to skip ahead. I'll just show you a couple of things. Countries never invaded by Britain. Uh, those are the countries in white. Uh, probably the most successfully bellicose country in history because it reached everywhere. And Britain, without much power anymore, still loves a good war everywhere. So they're the greatest cheerleaders for war. Now American wars, but they are the greatest cheerleaders. And then the American empire that followed. These are the 800 overseas military bases, none of which, in my view, are giving me much security, but that's another matter. Uh, it is uh, basically that we've reached this new, new era. And the peak, by the way, between the West and the rest, or between the North Atlantic and the rest, was in 1950, just when the colonial period was ending. And in 1950, it's just interesting to note, probably about 25% of the world population was in the North Atlantic at that time. Now it's about 10%. 56% of the literate adults in the world were in the North Atlantic. Now it's 16%. This is the most wonderful point, the spread of knowledge everywhere. 60% of world output was in the North Atlantic. Now it's perhaps 33%. And the cities were all North Atlantic cities, almost all. 53% of the world's urban population. Now it's 14%. So this is the decisive transformation. So here's where we need to be, and I'll just end here. Our new age needs to be the age of sustainable development. That means the age of global cooperation, the diffusion of technology, and the four pillars that I mentioned earlier, ending extreme poverty, social inclusion, environmental sustainability through technology transformation, and peace and cooperation. And climate change, I don't have to dwell on any of this here. The biggest danger is managing multipolarity. And that's where we come in in the UN system. The UN is, in my view, the greatest invention of modern times, our best hope for creating a world of peace. Uh, it was the brainchild of uh, America's greatest president, Franklin Roosevelt, one of the few presidents I can say was a good one. Uh, we've got a big mix, let's say, uh, but uh, Roosevelt had the idea of the United Nations. Uh, of course, his successor also uh, had the idea of the Cold War in a way which has persisted uh, till, till this day, unfortunately. We need a strong and effective UN to manage what is now truly a multipolar world. And uh, 
There are a variety of opinions about this. Uh, the U.S. neocons, of which Robert Kagan is uh, probably the chief writer, says that uh, only U.S. leadership can make a safe world. I beg to differ. Henry Kissinger says that only a balance of power can make a safe world, a little bit like what Adam Smith said, that it's the balance of force that can do this. The problem with balance of power theory is that it's very unstable. Uh, and uh, you don't keep a balance, uh, and it requires a lot of management. For Kissinger, the 19th century European order was his model, uh, called the uh, 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 Congress of Europe, uh, made by Metternich and others after the Napoleonic Wars. The problem is that the genius of managing that, uh, Bismarck, when he was fired from office, the whole system uh, ended up breaking down. The American view is there is no way to manage this other than through uh, militarization. And our leading realist in the United States, a good friend of mine and a wonderful political scientist, John Mearsheimer, says we are doomed to tragedy. So his most famous book, is called The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. And when I say to him, John, it's tragic. We have to do better. He said, no, no, we can't do better. But it's a tragedy. He says, yes. Well, I don't accept that. <laughs> but this is uh, American realism. Uh, again, we have the idea, uh, Graham Allison is not a determinist, but he says that maybe we are stuck with the Thucydides trap that the rise of China will provoke conflict over Taiwan or some other area. Uh, we had another theory, which I studied in graduate school by Charles Kindleberger, that says if you don't have a single hegemon, you can't have an order, because the multipolar system is inherently too anarchic. And then there's another theory, mine. Uh, my theory is global cooperation, that we ought to be grown up enough, sensible enough to be able to sit down, make a list of our problems, make a list of our solutions, and then make a list of agreed policies to actually solve the problems that we identified. And that we would take our world leaders and we at the UN would sit on the podium and we would give them oral exams to see how well they studied. I'm being facetious, but I'm being a little bit serious also. They should do their jobs. And their job is serious analytical work. They don't like that so much. So we should do it for them and give it to them and then help them through it. Because really the job of government is not studying so much. It's managing power. It's actually managing coalitions, even in the best of times. So it's not thinking so much. So we as thinking institutions need to say, here's an energy solution for the Asia Pacific region. Here's how it can be done. Here are the key steps. But then really try to apply diplomacy to say, this is in mutual benefit. And yes, there's a bit of free rider problem and prisoner's dilemma problem. But if we all go for the cooperative outcome, we're all going to be better off. And that's really what I believe is absolutely essential. And I am also very keen and very much appreciate China's recent Global Civilizations Initiative, which was launched last year, believing that we should tap into our cultural heritage in its best forms to help build the cooperative path. So I call it the ABCs of global cooperation, Aristotle, Buddha, and Confucius. Uh, there are a few other letters that one could add, but I believe that we need to respect the fact that ancient wisdom all calls on us to cooperate, to work harmoniously to uh, have enough detachment that we are not uh, in war with each other. 
And I think that uh, this cultural politics can help, not the kind of culture wars, but actually finding the commonalities of ancient wisdom. And uh, I always like to conclude uh, with President Kennedy, who was uh, my favorite president during my lifetime, um, because uh, for a year, he exemplified the greatest statesmanship possible. Uh, and that is the year between uh, October 1962 and November 1963. In October 1962 came the Cuban Missile Crisis, which came because of one American screw-up after another, followed by one Russian screw-up after another. Both sides terribly misbehaved. America invaded Cuba. Big, illegal, stupid action in uh, early 1961. And Khrushchev followed that by placing uh, offensive nuclear with missiles in Cuba. Stupid idea number two. And uh, Khrushchev's uh, foreign minister, uh, Andrei Gromyko, said to Khrushchev, what are you doing? You start a war. And he said, no, 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 I don't, no war. This is just to teach Americans a bit of their own, you know, their own medicine, to put their own face in it, but no war. And of course, it nearly ended the planet because things get out of hand, because uh, leaders uh, make mistakes, because every one of Kennedy's advisors virtually said go to war, because that's uh, their way. By the way, Utant played a magnificent role in supporting Kennedy and Khrushchev to find a peaceful way out. So the UN, it's not recognized so much, but the UN played an extremely important role in practical, hour to hour terms in defusing the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I give Kennedy huge credit, together with Khrushchev, in finding a peaceful resolution to a crisis that was within a hair's breadth of war. The next year, Kennedy did something completely unique in, I can't say that, he did something unique in American uh, political history, which is he went on a peace campaign telling the American people, we've got to get our heads screwed on better. The Soviet Union is not our mortal enemy. The Soviet Union would like peace just like we do, and we could therefore negotiate an agreement with them. I can't tell you how unusual this is for American politics or any politics uh, anywhere. But Kennedy campaigned for peace within the US, and he gave the greatest speech by a modern American president in June 1963, known to us as his peace speech. I wrote a book about it 10 years ago called uh, To Move the World, because I was moved so much by the speech. Um, and the whole speech is not pointing fingers at the other side. It's saying to the American people, let's think. They're humans. We're humans. We want this. They want the same thing. We ought to be able to reach an understanding. And of course, the whole Pentagon was against it. The Joint Chiefs of Staff were against it. Kennedy even had to hide the draft of the speech until the last moment so that it wouldn't be stopped by the State Department or by the Pentagon, or so he wouldn't be forced to change the speech. So he wrote it with Sorensen and on the airplane back from Hawaii in a conference at the last moments, didn't let anybody see it till the last moment within the US government gave the speech, Khrushchev loved it, called the American envoy in Moscow, Avril Harriman, and said, make peace with your president. And within six weeks, there was the partial nuclear test ban treaty negotiated. And um, I called the book, uh, my book, uh, To Move the World, because Kennedy then went to the UN General Assembly uh, and announced the treaty 
and it's the most beautiful speech also that I know of from the podium of the UN General Assembly. <clears throat> and he ends the speech uh, at the UN, and it's John Kennedy, and all the world leaders are in the General Assembly Hall. And he says uh, at the end of the speech that Archimedes was said to have told his friends, give me a place to stand and I can move the world. Fellow citizens of the world, let us take our stand in this place and in this time and see if we can move the world towards peace. And uh, then they killed him the next month. But the nuclear agreement was reached and uh, it became the basis for the non-proliferation treaty and um, it set a standard for statesmanship uh, that uh, shows we really can cooperate if we have virtuous leaders. And so Kennedy in this peace speech said these wonderful words and I'll end here. So let us not be blind to our differences but let us also direct attention to our common interests and to the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future. And we are all mortal. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Sachs, for, uh, as always, bringing some uh, light of optimism uh, and hope to uh, uh, to us uh, in the audience. Um, you know, your words always remind us, uh, or many of us, why we joined the UN in the first place, right? And uh, the mission and values uh, of the organization, and uh, particularly in this time of the age of sustainable development. So, thank you very much for 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 uh, those insights. Um, and I hope all of us take away something to, to think about tonight. Uh, we do have a lot of time uh, to uh, give our audience here in the conference room an opportunity to uh, engage with you on some of the points you mentioned and perhaps some other thoughts as well. Uh, so um, for now, I'd like to turn the time over to the audience and uh, ask if there are any questions or comments on uh, what we just heard from, uh, from Professor Sachs. Uh, if I could just ask you to please uh, first identify yourself and your affiliation, uh, and for the moment, just limit yourself to also just one question and, and maybe a follow-up. Uh, so uh, I see uh, Oleg from the Russian Federation. Let me start off with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mitch. Uh, I really would like to thank you, Professor, for your indeed very telling and profound lecture. I'm happy to be here in this room. And uh, first, like a quick preface and then a question. I understand the limit of time. Um, my name is Oleg Shimanov. I'm Deputy Permanent Representative to the UNSCAP. And out of my 40 years of diplomatic career, 35 years are dedicated uh, to sustainable development and environment uh, in the UN Department of the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation. And uh, I also, I'm uh, a visiting lecturer at the uh, Moscow State University of International Relations, though of course being a diplomat, I, I cannot boast about such a profound academic uh, background as you have. Uh, it's indeed a, a wonderful beginning of the year uh, here in UNSCAP that we may start the year with your lecture. Uh, with your indulgence, uh, as a quick preface, Financing remains one of the greatest challenges uh, in the context of achieving SDGs. This is a widely accepted view. Though my personal view, and I'm so happy actually to distill from your lecture that I'm on the right way, uh, taking into account what I could distill from your lecture, that the, the issue of financing is a secondary to the greater one, the lack of consolidated political commitment. I mean, uh, true political commitment, but 
not uh, bland uh, on the record speeches uh, delivered time from ta uh, time to time from the rostrum of the General Assembly Hall. And I even wrote down actually uh, your expression. We have to be grown up enough. That's what I cannot concur more, really. Uh, but let's come back to issue of financing. The UN Secretary General strategy for financing the uh, 2030 agenda is anchored in the understanding that financing for sustainable development is available given the size of global uh, financial system. And I also uh, did use from your lecture that it is indeed uh, uh, the fact, but uh, financing gap to achieve the SDGs in developing countries is estimated to be like 2.53 trillion per year. And unfortunately, unfortunately for me as a diplomat or uh, sustainable development optimist as <laughs> you are, uh, unfortunately those are quite old estimates. Uh, they are delivered, if I'm not, uh, what I can see, for, uh, they are derived from the UNCTAD report 2014, 10 years back. So here is my question. What is your best informed hunch? What is the financial gap today? And I, I have to confess that my question goes beyond the Asian Pacific. It's about the world. So what is the financial gap today? And why we also, why we only uh, focus our attention on developing countries. Many other countries, they also like emerging economies, like those countries under the uh, UNFCCC. And I was uh, the lead climate negotiator, and I do know from my lawyer's background that the economies in transition, they still do exist in terms of the UNFCCC. So why only we focus on the developing countries? What might be your guess? What is the financial gap? nowadays. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for a great, uh, great question. Um, so what do we mean by a financing gap? The way I would analyze that question is I would uh, try to measure the scale of investments in key areas that are needed to achieve the goals that we've set and compare that with the scale of current investments. And so uh, I like to think in terms of six categories of investment as constitutive of the SDGs, investment in education, investment in health, investment in clean energy and industry, investment in agriculture and sustainable land use, investment in urban infrastructure, and investment in digital uh, access and platforms. So education, health, industry, agriculture, urban infrastructure, and digital. And one uh, can, it's not easy to do, and I spend uh, my off hours on spreadsheets trying to answer this question uh, and have done so for the last 15 years basically what is the scale of investment needed? The right way to do this is bottom up, not one person sitting with his uh, Excel spreadsheets or uh, modeling, but actually teams that work on this. An example is the International Energy Agency's net zero to 2050 scenario, or UNESCO has estimates for education, uh, but strangely enough, as a UN system, we don't produce these numbers systematically very well because uh, the UN is uh, more diplomacy and less numbers. Uh, and it should be more numbers, uh, actually. Uh, we should have the capacity to produce these numbers quite systematically. I'll give you another weird reality of our system. And that's the IMF. The IMF is the organization in our family that is responsible for the macroeconomics. That includes scale of finance, especially public finance, as well as international borrowing. 
a few years ago, slightly maliciously, not really maliciously, but you'll get the point, I said to one of the leaders of the IMF, so how much does it cost to educate a child in a low-income country? And they said, well, I don't know. And I said, but that's your job to know. Uh, because uh, you're sitting with the finance minister. How much does it cost to have universal health coverage just per person? Well, I don't know. We had a very good discussion. Lovely person, by the way, very strong professional. They had never looked at this. Can you imagine, by the way, the IMF, which the job of the IMF is to consult with the finance minister, that's the core of the IMF's work, is to consult with the finance minister, had no idea of the unit costs for anything, whether it's energy, water connections, roads, putting a kid in school. Why? Because the way they do their job, till today, by the way, is, minister, what are your revenues? Now live within them. We're not going to dictate. We suggest you keep good social balance and so forth, but live within your revenues. Don't make trouble for the world by getting into debt trouble. So live within your means. My conception for the last 30 years of my professional academic life has been that the IMF should do something quite different. The IMF should say, minister, come sit next to me. Let's look at this spreadsheet together. <gasps> You have a big financing gap for education. Half your kids aren't in school. Hmm, let's add that. You don't have obstetrical care. Oh my God, let's add that. Uh, you need some roads. I see that half the people don't have electricity. Let's add all this together. Oh, you have a gap of $27 billion a year. And since we are the UN family system to help you, we're gonna help you go out to get good financing to cover that gap. That's my dream of what the IMF would do. Of course, the US would go a little crazy because the whole debate started with the US saying in 1944, we are the creditor nation, thank you. We will decide what gets lent. And that's what they told John Maynard Keynes in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire in 1944. And if you do know the uh, geography of power in the world, 15th and Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington is the Treasury, 16th and Pennsylvania Avenue is the White House, 17th and Pennsylvania is the Executive Office Building of the President, 18th and Pennsylvania is the World Bank, and 19th and Pennsylvania is the IMF. So. That's how this was created. I believe because the IMF has, I love the place, by the way, I've been spending my whole life trying to help them put the finance minister on this side and work together with them. And I've trained a large number of the staff and I tell them often, that's not what you learned in class. So I'm trying to help them do the right thing. But that's a power situation also, obviously. So to answer your question, first of all, there is no definitive answer to this. Second, so how big approximately? Uh, somewhere between three and five trillion dollars a year. Okay, now, is that a lot or a little? The world output is $100 trillion a year. The world saving is $30 trillion a year. So we're talking about 3 to 5% of world GDP. And we're talking about uh, maybe, uh, so, uh, sorry, 10% uh, to, 10% uh, to 16.6% of global saving. Perfectly manageable. And saving isn't fixed, it could rise and so forth. So the gaps are not 
huge. They are quite manageable, given that these are our major global goals. And certainly the gaps for the poorest countries are not at all big. Maybe, maybe a trillion dollars a year. And a trillion dollars a year is 1% of world output. And if, if you gave me a trillion dollars a year, I would be able to help every government get out of poverty. That would be enough to make investments, get all the kids in school, get health care for every person, get water and uh, electricity connection for every person. That'd be a great start. And you could do that for a trillion dollars a year for all the billion people in extreme poverty. So it's not huge. So then comes lots of detailed, interesting, analytical questions. First, some of it is for rich countries, but the gap there isn't really a financing gap. It's a political choice gap. They're just not making investments, but the finance is available. Where the gap is really most consequential is for countries that cannot mobilize this out of their domestic resources. A poor country cannot afford to get all its kids in school, by the way. This is very weird because you'd think, well, at least you can do that. But I've spent 10 years on this calculation. And if you're a low income country, it costs between 10 and 15% of GDP for universal primary and secondary education. Very high. The reason is teachers are relatively costly in low income countries. And there are a lot of young kids in low income countries because they have high fertility rates. So the whole age pyramid is very wide. So there's not an African country, low income or lower middle income country that can actually afford SDG four. And that should be the most alarming fact in the world, because you cannot have economic development without your kids educated. No matter what else you do, you cannot have economic development without educated kids. So it's for the low and lower middle income countries that the crisis is biggest. There are gaps in the high income countries, but I don't worry too much about them because those are political obstacles that should be filled, but it's manageable. Upper middle income is tricky because some upper middle income countries have good access to credit. Others don't have access to credit. Then there's another consideration. Sorry, and I'll draw I'll come come to a, a conclusion. Technically, what do you do? There are two uh, related issues. One, how could you make capital flow at relatively low cost and long term maturity to poorer countries? This is the major technical question on finance. If you look at the penalties that low income countries pay to borrow, they're quite steep. You pay 10 or 15 percent interest rates if you are a double B borrower sub investment grade compared to what a triple A or double A minus borrower pays. And why is that? <laughs> Long story, and I won't go into it, but making that flatter so that for poor countries, they have access to low cost capital is crucial. One way to do that is larger multilateral development banks. This is everybody agrees on that, though they don't agree to do it, but they agree that that's one part of the solution. More ADB, more AIIB, more new development bank, more World Bank. That requires capital increases. Capital increases mean larger voting shares for China. The United States needs to swallow and Europe needs to swallow and get on with it. So that's one part of what needs to be done. The second part is to de-risk private capital flows. That's also a tricky set of issues. I'd say I got into that question 45 years ago as a graduate student, and it's still somewhat of a puzzle. It's a long story, but it's not impossible to do that. There's one more dimension, and because also you're from the Russian Federation, I want to mention it. And that is that 
there is an intrinsic link between global finance and global monetary arrangements. And global monetary arrangements mean how we settle trade. And we are, of course, in a largely dollar-based settlements system. So the monetary system is largely dollar-based, not exclusively, but about 60%. And the United States, unfortunately and unwisely, weaponized the dollar-based payment system starting about 15 years ago by seizing assets, including Russian assets recently, the $300 billion seized in 2022, but also Iran, North Korea, uh, Afghanistan, Venezuela, and a number of others. To my mind, this is a completely unacceptable and self-defeating policy. It's cheap because the President of the United States can do it with a stroke of the pen. You don't have to ask Congress, you don't have to ask the public, you don't have to ask the UN, you don't have to ask anybody. To my mind, it's blatantly illegal and absolutely practically unwise. Because why would you use dollars if the US is going to take them away from you when they don't like what you're doing? The idea of payments is that they're reliable, not that they're political. So this is why the BRICS countries, especially under Russia's leadership this year, are negotiating non-dollar payments. And I support this entirely. And, but I also say to the US Treasury all the time, don't confiscate other people's money. It's not a good policy. It's not going to work. And the idea, by the way, of grabbing Russia's 300 billion for Ukraine is so illegal, you don't even know where to start. But these are politicians. They're not lawyers. They're not diplomats. They're not financiers. They want quick solutions for their reelections. So this is really a problem. But it's a problem that also has a solution because we just won't use the dollar in places where the United States policies could lead to confiscation. So all of this means we have a bit of a morass in the international financial system within our family of getting the right answers to the financing questions. There's actually one more technical point I need to mention, uh, which is that um, the IMF and the World Bank have what they call the Debt Sustainability Framework, or DSF. And it's based on an arbitrary set of numbers where they say, we grade you whether you're weak medium or strong in debt management. And then based on your ranking, we give you a ceiling of gross debt to GDP. And the ceiling is no more than 30% debt to GDP ratio if you are a weakly governed country. This is a death certificate. This is not economic policy. Why? Because if you're a poor country, it means almost by definition, you don't have electricity, you don't have paved roads, you don't have digital access, and your kids aren't in school. So what the IMF and the World Bank are telling you is stay that way. Don't bother us. Don't borrow because you might get into debt trouble. But if you don't borrow, you won't have electricity, schools, or anything else. They don't have an alternative solution for these countries. So they're telling the countries, don't borrow. I'm telling the countries, borrow. But my advice is borrow 30-year maturity, fixed interest rates, and on reasonable terms. Ah, but where do you get those? That's where I want the G20 to come into this story, to give an answer to that. But when I do, again, in my spare time, solving a growth model for how much you should borrow 
if you want to have your kids in school, have electricity and so on, exactly your question, the debt actually rises to about 200% of GDP before it starts declining 30 years from now. You want to borrow a lot because you don't want to live without electricity, you don't want to live without roads, you don't want to live without educated children, you don't want to live without health facilities. So you want to borrow, but you want the borrowing to be very long term so that you have 40 years to grow in order to repay the debt 40 years from now. The IMF has none of this intertemporal analysis because the debt sustainability framework is a five year snapshot. It's not a growth scenario. Now, I taught intertemporal growth for 30 years, and I, this is where I tell my students, you learn something, right? You borrow if the rate of return on your investment is higher than the cost of capital, and if you're not going to get into a debt crisis in the meantime. So we need to create a finance framework that can work. Final words. For this region, SCAP, there are a few countries that are seriously debt constrained or finance constrained. Most are not, but some are. For Africa, it's pervasive. The whole continent is debt constrained right now. So that's where the most serious problems are. Within this region, you have the means to solve the problem because this is a high saving region. And China has a saving surplus. That's why initiatives like the Belt and Road Initiative are wonderful. And they should really be encouraged. But the advice I give to China is when you lend for the Belt and Road Initiative, lend for 30 years. Don't lend for 10 years or 12 years. You will be disappointed and your counterpart will be very disappointed because they'll get into debt crisis. And that's what's happening right now. Not that China set a debt trap, that's propaganda. China didn't set a debt trap, it just set a maturity structure too short. And so when I speak to the Chinese finance authorities, I'm telling them 30 year loans and nobody thinks ahead more than China. So China needs to do the same thing of looking at a 30 year perspective and especially for the poor countries, give much longer term loans. And for the rest of the U.S., unfortunately, is not a net savings surplus country. It's a net debtor country, so it can't offer much in finance anymore. But the capital markets could offer more and we need to tap that. Sorry for the long winded answer, but a uh, good, uh, very good question. Important question. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yes, please. Sir. Thank you. My name is uh, Pramanapan Santipato. I'm a assistant abbot of the Vasugate or Golden Mount Temple, not far from here, and also a uh, founding chair of Institute of Buddhist Management for Happiness and Peace Foundation. So thank you very much for a truly inspiring lecture. And the at IBH Foundation, we're trying to drive Buddhism for SDGs. For example, uh, this bag, like created by the concept of circular economy. And when religious leaders like me carrying this bag, we're carrying the message. We ask people to scan QR code to learn more about Buddhism for SDGs and uh, how this bag reduces carbon footprint. So uh, my question to you is, uh, I'm very excited to see the ABC from their uh, of their ancient wisdom for the modern challenges uh, could you please uh, give us uh, more practical examples of their abc uh, so religious institutions and religious leader uh, won't be left behind to help society achieve sdgs ah, thank you. that is great uh, great uh, great question um in a nutshell uh, it's a uh, complicated, but I'm, I'm in very active discussion with uh, religious leaders and with many interfaith processes as well. And I'm an academician of the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences at the Vatican. 
And so that group helps to advise Pope Francis on economic issues, among other things. And one of the things that that group did was bring Ban Ki-moon and Pope Francis together in 2015 in advance of the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, on September 25th, 2015, the day that the SDGs were adopted, Pope Francis gave the opening speech to the General Assembly that morning, calling for a common ethics for the world, for our common home, as he called it. So in that context, uh, I'm in discussion with uh, myself, with lots of religious leaders, uh, with the Council of Elders, uh, Muslim Council of Elders, uh, with the uh, various Buddhist uh, communities, uh, and with also uh, secular philosophical traditions. So uh, three years ago, we started a process which was first called the Aristotle Confucius Symposium uh, with the idea of bringing Aristotle and Aristotelian philosophy and uh, um, Confucian philosophy together because they have a lot of uh, important ideas about virtue and about good behavior uh, that I think are very relevant today. And the Chinese government was very supportive and the Greek government as home to Aristotle was very supportive. So we've had two sessions like that. This uh, year, the Chinese government invited this group to meet in Shufu, uh, Shandong province, which is uh, Confucius's birthplace. There's a wonderful temple that is 2,500 years old, which is uh, where Confucius was born, where he grew up, uh, and where he uh, trained his students. And as soon as he died, it was turned into a, a shrine. And then every emperor since then, not every, but many emperors since then have built around it. So we're meeting there and adding Buddha to uh, our uh, um, agenda this year. Next year, we will meet in Angkor Wat, uh, hosted by Cambodia, uh, for a, a Buddhist-led uh, session. So Aristotle first, uh, Confucius, and then Buddha next year. I will be very happy to give you all the information, but the Cambodian government has uh, invited us to have this symposium. And the idea is uh, first to bring scholars together because I want to help find the common ideas uh, that can say that this is a common heritage uh, across the world. And I believe uh, that there is a common uh, ethical heritage, although the approaches are quite different. Uh, but the compassion and mindfulness of Buddhist teaching uh, or the rational emphasis of Aristotle or the ritual emphasis of uh, Confucius have a lot of common features to them about what good behavior really constitutes. So that's uh, one, one, of the, one of the ideas. Of course, another idea is to give confidence that uh, really our civilizations have a way to live together because uh, the, the values uh, fundamentally are are quite shared. And this, uh, the propaganda is the opposite sometimes, but the underlying truth, I think, is, uh, is a lot more optimistic than that. And so we're not exactly at the stage of practical right now. It's uh, about 150 philosophers mainly, and people in public policy that are working on this project leaders uh, in the academic world, uh, in the philosophical view, and then bringing more and more, we'll have uh, uh, this year uh, a leading uh, Islamic jurisprudence expert uh, coming also um, and um, bringing uh, the Muslim world uh, into uh, this active discussion. And I'm hoping that this will generate a uh, a widening ripple uh, effect of uh, saying, you know, we really are 
one family, uh, one, uh, one home, and that we can find uh, the, the common wisdom. But I'll be very happy to give you the detailed information. Thank you. Thank you. Um, go ahead, please. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeff, always a pleasure to be in the room with you. Uh, P.O. Smith, uh, I'm with you in FPA and the regional director here for Asia and the Pacific. Um, you know, I think a lot of us, in the, if not hopefully all of us in this room would agree that um, one of the main obstacles to sustainable development is the lack of gender equality. And you spoke about, you know, wars, uh, Jeff, uh, geographic wars, trade wars, etc. But perhaps the most crudest of all wars is the war against <coughs> women and girls and their basic fundamental rights, particularly sexual and reproductive um, health and rights. Um, we see increasingly how their, the bodily autonomy of women and girls is being weaponized um, across the globe. Uh, so I would just like to invite you to share some thoughts with us in terms of how you know you see the state of gender equality across the globe and how we can do more in that regard uh, with respect to sustainable development. Yeah, th well, thank you. Thanks for all that you do. Uh, Sonia and I have had one repeated experience, uh, I would say, common to all our work in villages all over the world, Asia, Latin America, and Africa, on this issue. Our experience, maybe a little optimistically put, but our experience is that every community where we've worked, the parents, especially and including the fathers, want their daughters to be educated uh, and um, that there is really a deep consensus that either has been built or can be built around that. And I, uh, this was one of the wonderful uh, discoveries for me in the Millennium Villages project uh, where we were working across 10 countries and in very uh, rural areas and uh, um, really distinctive uh, ethnicity, ethnic uh, areas, some Muslim, uh, some uh, uh, Christian of various faiths. And uh, we did not find resistance because our norm was all, all kids, girls and boys in school. And we only found enthusiasm for that. I'm sure that we've missed some, <laughs> some places that are more difficult, but to my mind, this is the single most empowering step that we should uh, internalize for everything about sustainable development, which is the value and empowerment of education of all the kids, and of course, with gender equality. And it's been the biggest mystery for me over a quarter century that this is not very high on the political radar screen. There are hundreds of millions of kids out of school. A young girl not in school, oh, the amount of abuse, uh, the, uh, the, la the um, utter disempowerment, all of the vulnerabilities that will come are profound. A girl that's in school all the way through completing upper secondary, is in a different, completely different situation. Even if her cultural milieu or family milieu is not optimal, she will learn something in general if the school is physically safe and if she can get there and, and uh, not be abused and so forth. So to my mind, of course, there are many issues that you're confronting on contraceptive availability and law and discrimination and access and knowledge. but where I am putting my, trying to put a lot of my time is on uh, education of all the kids and the most basic idea, we would never uh, allow our kids not to be in school for a moment, understanding the implication of that. And at the world level, that should be the overwhelming reality. And, the point I was making uh, earlier is that even in places where the leadership gets that, they actually can't afford it uh, in the low-income countries. 
and nobody is standing there to help them. It's the weirdest, weirdest thing. We have a, a an education shortfall that is a hundred billion dollars a year, maybe, maybe two hundred billion dollars a year, uh, just to get the kids in physically in school, and could be even a little bit higher than that. But remember, two hundred billion is point two of one percent of world output. We can't solve that problem, but we're not trying. And what we have for the system right now is uh, a check the box approach. We have the Global Partnership for Education, GPE, which as a name and a concept is wonderful. As a practice is funded at about $800 million a year. And that's the check the box, which is that uh, it's a hundredth of what it would should be. The Western leaders go and they give a hundred million dollars and they say, we love primary education or we love education. And the kids by hundreds of millions remain out of school. So this is where I this year want to, and for the summer of the future and in the finance contexts and at the African Union next month when I'll speak, the main point that I'm making everywhere is investing in children and that's all the girls as well as all the boys is the highest return financially economically as well as morally that you can make and the finance returns are spectacular you cannot develop a country without mass quality education and on the other hand if you have mass quality education you can almost not avoid development because even if the government messes up, the, the people themselves will find something, something useful to do. And it's not an accident that the fast growing East Asian countries are at the top of the PISA scores reliably. And we should take that. And I would say for SCAP, every country, every one of the member states should be in PISA. Measure, monitor, test testing matters it's real and if you put your pisa score in a cross-country growth regression the correlation is incredibly strong it's a tremendous predictor of economic success so it's not an accident again that uh, china uh, taiwan hong kong singapore korea japan they're all at or near the top of PISA, and they're, you know, the best performing economies in the world. And so this is just as a practical matter. So this is a little bit deviating, but that's where I'm putting the emphasis. And I'd like to see every young girl empowered with education and with the dream that they can do what they want because they're going to be well-educated and they're going to therefore have every opportunity open to them. Thank you. Uh, we have time for just one more question, I think, uh, over here. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sachs. Having sat in some of your classes at uh, the Kennedy School, yes. it's really a pleasure to welcome you <laughs> here you. in Bangkok. Um, I would, uh, I'm Faryal Khan from UNESCO, uh, working in education. And uh, it's really wonderful to hear you speaking about education. But wouldn't you agree that somewhere along the way, education has failed? Because most of our world leaders uh, who are making these decisions about war and about, <laughs> you know, uh, in, uh, they are coming from highly developed countries. So for me, uh, you mentioned uh, earlier that um, uh, we have the solutions, we have the technology, people don't get along with each other. You also mentioned education is a lever for economic development. But beyond economic development, we want peace in this world. We want to have sustain we want to live together with each other peacefully. We want to draw on our ancient wisdoms and cultures and traditions to to live to e with each other peacefully and with our planet uh, in a responsible way. What do you think do learners need to learn in classroom the skills and attitudes and values to bring about the behavioral change to actually 
make that transformation take place. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, everybody should uh, take out your uh, search engine and reread Target 4.7 of the SDGs uh, because this is education for sustainable development. And education for sustainable development says that every child should learn about sustainable development, about culture, about tolerance, about peace, about global citizenship. It's a wonderful, wonderful target. And it relates, in my mind, to an ancient Greek idea that I like very much called paideia. Paideia in ancient Greece meant the curriculum to form a virtuous member of the polis. So to form a virtuous member of the political community. And Aristotle was very keen on paideia, and the Greek culture was very keen on paideia. It meant, what should a child learn to be a good citizen? Not only to learn STEM uh, or to uh, learn uh, particular skills, but to learn good citizenship. So this is an idea that I am trying myself to uh, promote and develop. And I'll just mention in an advertisement, um, I'm making a class together with uh, UNESCO, uh, actually, uh, with uh, Stefania Giannini, the uh, um, Assistant Director General for Education, uh, call on ages of globalization. And the idea of the class is we had the very good fortune to visit uh, 22 countries, the UNESCO heritage sites. And we went around to film at the UNESCO heritage sites to discuss their meaning in global culture, global history, uh, how they ex fit into sustainable development. And I am in the process of uh, completing a curriculum available to everybody for free, available, uh, it's going to be, turns out, as everybody knows, with AI, though I spoke everything in English, everything is going to be nicely dubbed in any language that you want. All the materials will be available in, uh, in multiple major languages. And this starts in September 2024. And once a month, uh, I'm going to have a global classroom for all of the students that are participating, and I hope it's hundreds of thousands or millions, that we will at least have a live Zoom. They'll get online. I want to bring the Secretary General or uh, Armida or other leaders uh, to meet the students uh, in a live online Zoom from wherever they are and create this idea of a curriculum that is an enriched curriculum about global citizenship gives students the concept that they are really part of a, a world, part of a global community, and also have a, an online, live, once a month global classroom that connects students all over the world so that they're also feeling they're part of uh, this uh, global university. So this is a UNESCO project. Uh, and uh, I will be delighted to uh, keep you updated. But for any education minister or any community that wants to be part of this, it's free, open materials, and uh, not bad, I think, actually. It, it's a lot of wonderful filming and visits to amazing places. And I think it helps, it will help to give this real understanding about the world that we're in. So thanks for the chance to mention that. Thank you very much, Professor. I think, I think that was a great question to end our session on and our time together today. Um, thank you, of course, to the audience for those questions. Uh, and uh, finally, once again, please join me in thanking Professor Sachs for sharing his thoughts with us today. Thank you. That's our program for today. Thank you very much uh, for uh, joining us in person and also thank you to the audience online. 
I think for SCAP colleagues, we uh, have a extra special treat. We'll get to spend more time with you. <laughs> so uh, we'll see uh, the SCAP colleagues in uh, meeting room H. Thank you. Thank you. Not at all.